It's 2020. Unfortunately, American society has yet to mature enough to understand that we must repair and build race relations and finally destroy systematic oppression. Some steps forward are holding those in power accountable, learning the power of a united front of African Americans utilizing their economical value and voting to rebuild our communities, restructure legislation, and build wealth. Today I had the opportunity to interview freeholder candidate Tracy Wells Huggins of Vineland, New Jersey. And it was then that I was connected with the Alliance for Youth Justice and the Campaign for Youth Justice. And I know that there are other people who think just like me that kids never belong in a cage. Grandson, and I'm concerned for him. I'm concerned because of racial disparities that exist. I'm concerned because our system, even though it has made tremendous strides, still has a long way to go. Another one of my areas of of a priority is the need for families to learn how to advocate effectively for their young people, be it in any system, school, mental health needs, or the prison pipeline, um, and in just teaching people the importance that their voice has. Oftentimes, most of the people in most disenfranchised communities don't believe that their voices have power. So we look to lift that up in all the ways that we can with our families and youth in our programs. It's Tracy Wells hugging. Whenever people ask me that, I always say, who isn't Tracy Wells Huggins? Um, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, I'm a person who lives in Cumberland County, who loves the county, who sees the potential that we have. Um, I'm an evangelist, not the typical evangelist, people who know me know that, but I think it's important to state that uh, I'm definitely a woman of faith and that I just love everything about the possibility of black excellence in our community. All right, well with that being said, what are some benefits or cons that you see living in Cumberland County all in your life? Um, I was born in Newark and I was raised down here for the majority of my life. And some of the things that I see as benefits are the beauty of the landscape. Um, I see the ability to make connections and to have those connections lend itself to having the potential for village, and we need that. Some of the cons are that the people that you would most expect to buy into that mindset appear to have adopted a very individualistic mindset, and so it prevents us from really coming together to the extent that we really could. I see opportunity to make change around that, but I know it's gonna require a lot of attention, it's gonna require a lot of desire, and it's also gonna require for us to lay down a lot of the stuff that has happened and that will more than likely continue to happen if we don't change right. to cause division among the people. Okay. Could you explain what a freeholder actually does? <laughs> How do they impact the community? And why do people need to know about them today? So yeah, so the freeholders actually control the budget for the entire county. Mm. And what that means for us on a local uh, sense is that we have to know where our dollars are being spent. One of the things that some of the organizers taught me when I first came into activism and organizer work across the country is always follow the dollars. And so freeholders get to define how the dollars are spent for the people important. What inspired you to become a candidate for freeholder in this, in this county? I never foresaw running into any political realm to this degree. I've always been one that says that my outside jumper is wicked and so I preferred being on the outside because I felt as if you could have much more push to get things done in that way. And that's kind of a sad testament to some of the things that we've seen in folks in power, right? Mm -hmm. You want to sit at the table with them. You don't want to be on the menu, but you really don't want to be a token either. Mm -hmm. So I've always said, you know, let me stay on the outside so I can remain true and authentic to who I am. Mm -hmm. And this opportunity presented itself. And I figured it would be high time for us to have somebody who's going to be able to be bold in those spaces somebody who's gonna be willing to be unapologetic, someone who really cares and has had skin in the game and skin in the game in terms of community connectivity and being there when the chips are down. And someone who doesn't have any other agenda other than the fact that 
I realized there was a need for real change. I want my grandson to grow up in a community where he is loved, he is um, treated with respect and dignity, mm -hmm. that he can love in return, and one that is dedicated to making sure that he gets to live his best life at every level. I want to live in a community where my adult children, should they decide to remain in Cumberland County, can say, you know what? There was a change that was needed and my mother played a part in that. I want my husband to be able to be proud to say, that's my boo. She's always fighting the power, but she's doing it from her heart. I want to be able to live out a full, a full purpose, um, what God has for me, and being a voice for people who normally have not been heard. All right. What are your thoughts on the effectiveness of our current freeholders? Have they shown accountability? Has it produced value or has it been stagnant? I will say that Freeholder Barber is one of my favorite freeholders. Um, she actually puts her action behind her words. And that's incredibly important to me personally, but also I think it's important for all of us to know and understand. A few months ago, there was an NAACP uh, Meet the Candidate Forum, and she was before the people, along with many other folks. And I spoke and I asked about the importance of youth justice transformation. You'll almost never hear me use the term juvenile. I try to get away from that. But I asked about us possibly making October Youth Justice Awareness Month in our county, because we've done it all over the country in partnerships with some really um, large entities. And she said, talk to me about that. And there were some other folks in the room that had positions of power who said the exact same thing. And she was the only one to follow up. Mm -hmm. She was the only one to make sure that that proclamation got passed. So I say all of that to say, I can't speak to the investment of the other freeholders. I'm not all that familiar with what they have done. I can say that I haven't seen much in terms of community connectedness, mm -hmm. and that could be my own fault because I'm all over the place. Mm -hmm. However, I will say this, it is important for people who represent you to be seen by you. And so with that being stated, it is also important for us to make sure that our personal agendas, if we have them, are not the things that guide how we make decisions for the communities we say we serve. What would you like to see your county look like based on finance, economic growth, crime, etc.? I would love to see Cumberland County um, be much more reflective of the people who live in the cities that surround the county. I would love to see the folks in power be willing to display a real commitment to change mm -hmm. because let's be clear, most systems that are in place operate the way they were designed mm -hmm. to work and they do that really well. If we are going to have real change, I would love to see our community come together and not be so much party driven, but be people focused. Mm -hmm. I think that, in my personal opinion, we have a golden opportunity to make sure that we have an expansion of knowledge, mm -hmm. that we change the way we do policing in our area. We understand, and I'm going to state this for the record because you have to state it because you know someone is going to state it. Mm -hmm. Not all cops are bad. Right. And coming from a family of police officers, state troopers, and business owners, and nurses, mm -hmm. I understand the importance and the impact of frontline staff. Mm -hmm. Maybe better than a lot of other folks. But with that, we have to understand that the systemic racism that lies within policing systems is something that we need to really look at and we need to address. And it would be so incredibly powerful to have that happen right here mm -hmm. in our own home and potentially be the model, not just for the state, but for the country. Yes. Because the data says that we have some of the worst statistics in terms of use of force, mm -hmm. in terms of police brutality, in terms of those rogue cops getting away with literal murder. Mm -hmm. And so we have an opportunity to change that. In terms of economic growth, it would be great to see with all of the startup businesses that we have now, to have them actually have support for their infrastructure building. Mm -hmm. 
I spoke about this on a post recently. A lot of people have an idea for a business and ideas are fantastic. And then they may, able, may be able to get that business off the ground. But what happens is that many times they don't have the infrastructure to maintain that building. And so there's no opportunity for people to really keep their business afloat. And so they come and then they go. We need to, in our community, build up the educational support and maybe the business to business mentor opportunities so that people can know how to grow those businesses to keep them sustainable. So I think that's a really good thing there. In terms of community education and young people, I am all about and have been for years about the importance of not just leading the education of any child to the school system. We need to be working in tandem with them. And one of the best ways we can do that is by having strong, solid, consistent community-based organizations. And we have to get beyond the box of evidence-based because a lot of what we see that actually works for our young people is not evidence-based by federal standards, but it's evidence-informed mm -hmm. by the results that we see in the young people who continue to just rise above obstacle after obstacle mm -hmm. simply because they met a J.T. Burke, mm -hmm. simply because they know a John Fuqua, and a few of them maybe because they know Miss Tracy. Well, you mentioned education and business. As our representative of, for this country, what are some things that you would be willing to take on head on swiftly if you were to get into office? I would definitely be looking into um, our mass incarceration. I would be looking into our prison system. That's really important for me. I would be looking into health. As a nurse, it's important for me to make sure that people have access to good health care and that they are making an attempt to keep everybody safe especially in light of COVID-19. A lot has happened in light of COVID-19. And there's been a lot of conversation and there's a lot of, been a lot of negative banter back and forth between folks in power. And I really don't think that it needs to be. One of the key things that a professor from Georgetown taught me was, you never have to argue if you just look at the data. And if the data says that there's a problem, then there's no need for the argument. Let's just fix the problem. And so, yes, looking at healthcare and carceral situations, looking at healthcare among our community members, looking at making sure our community roads are well kept, Make, because that's money that's allotted and we can take care of right away. Making sure that recreation is made available, because that's money that's allotted and we can do that. Do you know that there was a time in Cumberland County where there were almost no dollars dedicated to prevention? And that's an issue. And as a nurse, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Mm -hmm. So if we can get ahead those things, ahead of those things, then I think that we'd be able to make some immediate inroads and ground, not just with the people, mm -hmm. but also with the community as a whole, for longevity. Mm -hmm. We have got to stop putting Band-Aids on situations. And we have got to stop being reactive, because we have been an incredibly reactive community. Mm -hmm. And now is the time for us to think forward. I would also be heavily, heavily leaning towards instituting civilian review boards mm -hmm. because we want to make sure that the community is being able to be heard in terms of brute force by police. And because of our data, it's something that we need significantly. Mm -hmm. What are some things that you absolutely cannot stand for that you see in our community right now? Oh, one of the things that I absolutely um, can't stand, it breaks my heart, is the inability of people to come together. We see a lot of show of solidarity right now. And I also can't stand the fact that we don't ever really take it beyond the immediacy of the moment to the much less sexy work of being hands-on at the table for the long haul. Mm -hmm. We don't organize we don't strategize. We've been limited in our ability to mobilize so that we can have real forward movement. Mm -hmm. And people bank on that from us. And that is heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And it is something that I will vehemently always educate people about. Mm -hmm. Whether you're black, brown, or white, you have a responsibility. It is your duty to fight for the freedom that we need. Mm -hmm. I often recite Asada's chant in regards to that, because we have a duty to fight for our freedom, we have the duty to win. 
And the way that we do that is we have to love each other and respect and support each other. Mm -hmm. The lack of community support, even from people who look like you, is heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And I think it's time that it get called out, addressed, so that we can uproot it and fix it. One of my favorite preachers says, you can't fix what you will not face. Mm -hmm. And just as that is in our personal lives, so it is in our communal lives. Wow. You talk about being in it for the long haul. Could you explain the importance of voting right now more than ever for people in our community? Yes. So there's been a lot of talk of revolution. And I, nobody loves a good revolution or a protest more than me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely no one. <laughs> However, I understand the power of being at the tables of power and we need to make sure our voices are heard. Voting is one aspect, but it's a critical aspect. And even though sometimes people say, well, you know, I don't need to vote, it doesn't matter, it does matter. If you choose to not vote, you have made a choice and you have voted. So to not be active in the process for whatever reason is detrimental to the whole. And we've got to get out of the mindset of the me and begin to thinking about the we. Because it's we where the power lies. We the people. We need to come together. And voting is a great way to do that. And if you don't want change, it'll be reflected when you go to the polls. I have to say, I've been on such a learning curve since March 9th when I was asked to, to begin this journey. And I have vacillated back and forth between staying in mm -hmm. or saying, y'all can have this. Mm -hmm. And the reasons for that has become, been because there's just so much to learn. And the more I learn, the more the eyes are open, the more heartbreaking it can be at certain times. But I also know that somebody needs to be willing to stand in the gap. And if God has chosen me to be one of those people at this time, then I'm going to stand tall and stand strong and flat-footed and, you know, really just work hard to make sure that the people are heard. But I cannot do that if folks make a decision that, ah, uh, I'm not going to vote. And when you don't vote, you kind of say, you like being the underdog. And that's never been my space. Once I came out of that, I made a decision never to go back. Most people think about the presidential election when they think of voting, but well, when does one vote for the freeholder? Well, whenever there's an opportunity. Every local election we should be voting in. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I had to learn too over the course of time. We don't really focus on local elections. People will come out to some degree for the big elections and they'll say, hey, I voted. They got the pins, they have the stickers. You see them taking pictures at the polls or outside. I get all of that. But we have to be party, consistent, and present in every election. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to do our due diligence on all of our candidates as well. And while I'm thinking about it, and we're having this conversation, I think we need to be looking at the different councils that exist. Mm -hmm. We need to look at the makeup of our school boards. We need to look at the makeup of different organizations that represent different people. Mm -hmm. Because we need to find out who are these folks that are in power and what are they doing that reflects my concerns. We have an obligation to have conversations with them, to attend meetings. We need to make sure that our community is improving because we are putting in the work. We leave it to a few and we stay hands off, then we remain powerless. Mm -hmm. And power concedes nothing without a demand. Yeah. Wow. All right, let's gonna talk about race in America. Mm. Right. So we see, we see America now, the uprisings, people are frustrated, African Americans are looking for equality and not just in policing, all right, but in every facet of life. What solutions do you feel can be addressed in black and brown communities? Where do you see the gaps personally? Mm. That's not a loaded question. I have the blessing of being the chairperson for ethnic and cultural diversities for the nation um, through the Coalition for Juvenile Justice in DC. We have these conversations a lot. Mm -hmm. And even though our focus is on youth justice transformation, mm -hmm. um, you see how the layers of racism affect everything. Mm -hmm. 
I say all that to say that in our community, we have to do more than just see ourselves um, in terms of our respective skin color, tone, race, ethnicity, and begin to see the humanity in each other. And even though that may sound you know, really cliche, the reality is we don't honor humanity in one another many times. How can I say that? I can say that because we watched a man snuff out another man's life, reposition himself on this man's neck. And we saw this play out with people standing around him, asking, begging for him to stop. And it can happen there. And then we can see people in our own backyard saying that black lives don't matter, missing the point that humanity is what we need to be recognizing. Mm -hmm. And until we begin to recognize humanity in other folks, we can never even begin to have a conversation about race. Mm -hmm. We have to, when we do begin to have the conversation, be willing to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. People don't want to be uncomfortable, but we have to be. We have to be willing to recognize that this is not a blame game, this is a fact-based, data-driven, day-to-day expression of the systemic underlying racism in our country. And we are affected by it. Mm-hmm. I was pulled over in Georgia this weekend, and I was scared to death. Why? Because as soon as the officer got out of his vehicle, his hand was on his gun. Mm-hmm. Why is that relevant for here? Because almost every time somebody gets arrested or pulled over or anything, the hand goes to the gun. Mm -hmm. As part of their training, I get that. And yet, I think that there's an opportunity for us to just honor the fact that black folks and brown folks and folks who live in poor communities, no matter what their color is, live in a constant state of trauma Mm -hmm. because of the fear that comes along with that. So a lot of what you see is a response to that trauma Mm -hmm. and in our community where there's a lot of trauma there's a lot of economic issue that drives or attributes to the trauma there's a lot of experience that people have lived and lived experience makes you an expert Mm -hmm. um, that people don't get to address properly Mm -hmm. so we have a lot to unpack and we have a lot of firsts in our county which is beautiful. Mm -hmm. However, we need to make sure that the folks who are the first also understand that they have an obligation to not be the last and to make an impact while they're in those roles. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned the first in our county. I just wanted to ask you, how do you feel about the changes that are beginning to take place in our community, the protests and the rallies and things? Can you speak to that? Yeah, I have been really, really excited about the things that I've seen. Um, I've seen solidarity in a way that I've not really seen to this extent in this area. So it's great to be home in my backyard and see it. I have seen people protest with grace and dignity and with power and grab the attention of everyone. I have also seen the flip side. I have seen folks use this to capitalize on their own moment to be seen. Mm -hmm. I have seen folks um, over maybe politicize the moment Mm -hmm. for whatever reason. I have seen folks that have not been seen (laughs) that decided they wanted to come out and be seen. And it's been um, a myriad of emotions. But ultimately, I've been so proud of the way people have stood tall and how we have taken great care of our community, how we have defied the lie Mm -hmm. of they're going to tear everything up because they're angry. Mm -hmm. They being anybody of any color that is in the crowd, that is marching down Landis Avenue, that is marching down High Street, that is marching down Commerce in Bridgeton. Mm -hmm. We have showed up with intention and with great dignity And I am incredibly proud of that. And I would love to see that translated into us now coming inside Mm -hmm. so that we can strategize. Because there's power in that walk. Mm -hmm. There's power in that talk. But there's power in the policies that get changed from the pen 
after all this is said and done. That's what I'm excited to see. All right, you've been a public advocate for more than 20 years. Mm. (laughs) Through that experience, what characteristics do you believe you've developed that can assist others in the community you seek to serve? You develop a thick skin Mm -hmm. when you get hurt by your own. Mm -hmm. You develop uh, a commitment that's deeper than you ever imagined when you realize that even though you spoke to 10, one came back and said, I learned something, and then they continue to come back. Mm -hmm. You develop um, an awareness of your power when you come around people and they look at you and they know that they know you, but they're afraid to say certain things to you. Mm -hmm. Not that you want people to be afraid of you because you know, I think I'm one of the sweetest people ever. Right. (laughs) But you also develop a sense of village that maybe you didn't have before. Mm. There are people who are hungry for that. And you will develop a sense of pride in the way that you walk down the street Mm. because you know that you are being a part of solution-driven action in your community. And it's not that haughty pride. It is a pride that is built on love. Mm -hmm. Like I love to see the kids who I know that I've been able to touch. I love to see that many of them are adults. I love to see them when they come into my inbox and they say, I was thinking about you, or they send me a message and say, I love you. I love when they text me and I'm old now and I don't remember who it is and I have, they have to remind me. Mm-hmm. But it's just really um, so beautiful to see that you are making changes in your community that will have long lasting footprints. Mm-hmm. I always hear people talk about boss which was the um, cultural center that was in Bridgeton. And I remember the tin can very, you know, a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I do say that when people mention boss and the cultural center that was there, that their eyes light up Mm -hmm. because they were making an impact in the community. And from my understanding, they were bold and unashamed. Mm -hmm. And there is something about seeing your community rise and knowing you've been a part of that that just fills your heart with a joy that I can't explain. So I would say for anybody who wants to get into the real work of organizing, because a lot of what you see right now is real sexy. Everybody wants to be an organizer and activist, I get it. Mm -hmm. Um, But if the real work of organizing is really explained to you, it's staying in it when it's no longer sexy. Mm -hmm. It is staying in it when nobody will support you. Mm -hmm. It is finding a way to make something happen. It is trusting God that if this is the purpose he has for you, that this good thing will happen. Mm -hmm. And it's also about making sure that you are sowing good seed because people reap what they sow. Mm -hmm. And I have been blessed to reap tremendous blessings from just being a lover of people. Again, I'm not a politician. Mm -hmm. I love people and I love my people. Yes, love that, love that. Finally, when it's all said and done, and you speak with so much passion and after all the blood shed and tears if need be what legacy as a freeholder would you want to leave in Cumberland County that she pushed the envelope that she maintained truth that she brought the concerns of the people before the power and that she never ever compromised on that. That she never sold her people out because she knew that they, that been done enough. Mm-hmm. That um, she never took for granted the fact that they trusted her to do something for them. Yes. And that my children will say, my mom, she was a bad chick. Yes. And she helped to make this community better. Mm-hmm. I'm building legacy mm-hmm. for my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren to say my grandmother knew what she stood for and she held strong to that. And that's something that nobody can ever take away. Win, lose, or draw, they're going to be able to have that as their legacy. And I think that anybody in power should want that for their loved ones as well. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for sharing with me today. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. (laughs) Thank you so much.